morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? I don't think I'm in very good company because Zach was uh, just talking about how he's anti-Christmas this time of year, and I heard a lot of applause, and I was getting ready to come out and say, we're all my Christmas fans. Uh, thank you, thank you. I love it. It's cold, right? And it's awesome, awesome. I love this time of year. I am a Christmas person through and through, January, March, April, May, June, July, August. You just... Uh, it doesn't matter. I've got Christmas music playing on in my, uh, my office right now. I just, baby, it's cold down. All right, that's enough. So anyway, good morning. Welcome. If you don't know me, my name is Pastor Mac. I serve as the executive pastor here, um, and it's an absolute joy to be able to do that. And if you're joining us online, just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us and giving us a, an hour or so of your time this morning. Uh, but before we get started in our series or our message today, um, yesterday, you know, it's something for me, and I'm sure it is for you guys as well, was a, was a special day yesterday. Um, and if you don't know, yesterday was Veterans Day. And, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and as I said, as we're celebrating the veterans who have a connection with our people in our congregation, uh, veterans are men and women who have been called to serve and to protect this wonderful nation that we have and this morning, we're honoring those men and women who have served our nation. Uh, we know that many of our veterans come from war zones uh, that have scars and injuries from overseas conflicts. However, we are grateful for their willingness to serve and sacrifice for our nation. And so for today, I want to say thank you. Um, we also want to thank the families that have stood by their soldiers, spouses, grandparents, and friends who have sacrificed while their loved ones were overseas. These people have prayed many, many prayers asking God to protect their loved ones when they went off into conflict. Many have had to go the extra mile to take care of the family and to support the community while their spouses were performing their duty. And the thing that I love the most about celebrating Veterans Day is that a soldier must have great faith when he or she signs the paper that reveals their willingness to serve in the military. And I'll never forget the day when myself and 12 other men from the 175th Security Forces Squadron, when we left in January of 06, um, to get on that bus to head to Iraq. And many families have gone through those experiences and wondered if their loved ones would return home. The hugs are given to our families, but immediately the focus must be then on the mission to protect our country, the United States of America. And these are emotional times that have been part of families, many families, throughout centuries. The third person, if you will, that I want to thank today is I want to thank God. Not for not only hearing our prayers, but also providing that protection and care during those dangerous times. It is good that we say thank you to our veterans, but it's also important that we say thank you to our God. Paul writes in Ephesians 1.3, he says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united in Christ. So with that, I would love to ask if you have ever served in the past or even currently, or if you have had a loved one who has served and has passed due to that, please stand with me and give him a round of applause. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, men and women, for your service and your sacrifice to this country. Moving into our message, this is the fifth installment of our Follow Me series, and today is a call to live. And if you were to ask people what the most important day of the year is for Christians, I think most would probably respond, Christmas. And it certainly looks that way, not only in our culture, but in churches. And I don't want to take anything away from Christmas because it's the annual celebration of the mind-boggling truth, and you can read this in John 1, 1, that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That's a big deal for Christians. That's a huge deal. But if I can do so without taking anything away from Christmas, I want to stress that the event that we are going to be talking about today 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, after he had suffered and died on a cross to pay for my sins, to pay for your sins, the whole world's sins, is not only the single most important event in history, it is the single most important event in my life. And if it's not already the most important event in your life, I sincerely hope by the end, by the time we leave here today, that it will be, because it can be. We're going to take a look at Matthew 28 today. So if you don't have a Bible, we've filled every chair today with Bible. So definitely take one of those out if you don't have a Bible. Uh, that's your Bible. Write your name in it. Take it home with you. Uh, but like I said, we're going to be in Matthew 28 today, looking at the first 10 verses. As we begin our exploration of Jesus' revelation to the world and three simple but life-changing responses, I want to suggest to the glorious truth of Jesus' resurrection. So follow along as I read aloud from Matthew 28, the first 10 verses. Start off, it starts off at 28.1. Early on a Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel, angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said it would happen. Come, see where his body was laying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there and remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them. And greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. And there it is, the, one of the earliest accounts of the historical event that we're talking about today. But if you allow me, I would like to ask an important and often neglected question. What difference does it make? Really, in practical terms, how is this resurrection that we're going to be talking about, how is it supposed to reflect or affect me? What did it really accomplish? What difference does it make that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, in order to answer that question, let me ask you this. Did you know that Jesus' resurrection is not the only recorded resurrection in the Gospels. It's not even the first. There were three resurrections, each performed by Jesus, each which foreshadowed his own resurrection, and each of which points to his resurrection. And I would like to add each of which gives an answer to this question what difference does it make? And this is the first one right here. And you can find this in Luke 8 if you want to switch. I'll kind of give you a summary, but I'm not going to go verse by verse. But the first point is this. Don't be afraid. And in Luke 8, you have um, a man named Jairus came up to Jesus. Uh, he was the top official in the Jewish synagogue in that area. And he found Jesus. And listen to this. He threw himself. He threw himself at his feet and begged him to come to his house and heal his 12-year-old daughter. So Jesus agreed, but before they got to the man's house, someone came up to Jairus and said, your daughter is dead. There is no use in troubling the teacher now. Jesus heard their messenger's word and told Jairus, don't be afraid. Can you believe that? The man had just been told that his daughter was dead. And Jesus' first words to him is, 
don't be afraid. Sounds crazy, right? But Jesus, he didn't stop there. He went to the man's house, and he went to the girl's room, and the Bible says in Luke 8, 54, 55, he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up, and then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. And if you read just a few verses before that, you will have the people who were there, who were present, witnessing this, laughing at Jesus because they already knew that she was dead and did not think of what he could do was possible. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. He says it to you too. You see, death used to be it. It was the end of the road, end of the story. But then came Jesus and he said, don't be afraid. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, death has been swallowed up in the victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? And another way to say it is that with his resurrection, Jesus buried death. And as Jesus told Jairus, he says to you, don't be afraid. You hear the same words in the account of the women at Jesus' tomb. We just read it in Matthew 28. The angel said to the women, don't be afraid. You need not to fear death. It is a conquered enemy. And raising Jairus' daughter, Jesus demonstrated his mastery over death. But that's not all. Because the second answer I suggest to this question, what difference does it make, is this. Don't cry. On another occasion, if you flipped over to uh, Luke 7, just a chapter before, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him as he approached the town gate. A dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and said, Don't cry. He then went up and touched the platform that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The den med set up and began to talk. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Did you hear Jesus? Jesus told that poor widow who just lost her son, don't cry. And what an odd thing to say. You have to wonder, did he really expect the mother to say, oh, I'm sorry? No, that's absurd, right? He, did he really expect her tears to stop? Because it seems strange. Of course she cried. Who wouldn't? Anyone would that's in her position. Except that Jesus knew the rest of the story. Jesus knew what she did not. Jesus knew what she would soon learn. Jesus knew what she was about to see with her own eyes. Because Jesus' voice breaks the bond of death every single time. So don't cry. It is a command that was echoed outside the garden tomb. You can see in John's gospel, he records in John 20, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and she wept, and she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Then they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Why wouldn't she cry? Like that poor widow in Nain, why wouldn't she cry? Until Jesus came, and he chased the tears away. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't cry that when we lose a friend or a loved one. But it does mean for all those who have experienced new life through faith in Jesus Christ, we do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. And you can see that in 1 Thessalonians 4. So don't cry. Because with the, his resurrection, Jesus fulfilled the, prophet Isaiah, the, fulfilled the prophet Isaiah's promise. And in Isaiah 25, he says, He will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. 
He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. So don't be afraid. Don't cry. And finally, believe. There was one more resurrection that foreshadowed Jesus' victory over the grave. And this is in, uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. One day, Jesus received a message from his friends, Mary and Martha, telling him that their brother Lazarus was sick. By the time Jesus arrived on the scene, however, Lazarus had not only died, but when Jesus got there, he had already been in the tomb for four days. And the Bible tells us that when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. And again, Jesus saying, I am the resurrection. Martha had faith in the afterlife. Jesus said, I am the life. Martha believed. Jesus said, believe in me. Jesus' victory over death makes believing in him more than possible. It should make it irresistible. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, let me put it in the most simplest terms that I can. Very briefly, it means agree with him. Another way to say this is confess. You see, Jesus said, no one is good except God alone. And that's in Luke 18. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, none of us is good enough to please God or earn eternal life on our own merit. It can't happen. We may not be as bad as the next guy. We may not have done as many wrong things as the next person. But none of us can get there without help. And the first help, the first step in getting help is to agree about your sins. It is to say to him that you were willing to repent, which is simply means you were willing to turn away from your sinful ways. You were willing to turn around immediately and stop doing what you're doing and turn to Jesus. And that is where we get his help. And if you can do that, if you can confess your sins to Jesus Christ, the next step would then to believe in him. Jesus said, whoever believes in me will never die. And that means saying to Jesus, Lord, I believe that if I ask you, you will forgive all of the wrong things that I have done. You are willing to wipe my slate clean. Come into my soul and make me a new person inside and give me eternal life so that I can start living for you in this life and with you in the life that is to come. So Jesus, since I believe all that, I am asking you to do it. Please, I beg you, come into me. The truth is, it's, it really is that simple. It's not necessarily going to be easy, but it is simple. And that's what it means to believe in Jesus. That leaves one more step, and that is commit to him. You see, if you come to Jesus and find new life, eternal life in him, you'll find that this resurrection business is not a transaction. It's a way of life. It's not a checkbox. It's not a doing things out of obligation. It's not, I give because that's what I'm supposed to do, or I, I read my Bible because that's what I'm supposed to do, or I come to church because that's what I'm supposed to do. When you understand that it's a way of life, it's more organic than that. It's willing to say, you know what, I want 
to spend that time with you, Jesus. I crave that time with you, Jesus. God, I want you to be in every aspect of my life. Not out of some blind obedience, but because you want that relationship with him. I talked about a treasure in the field uh, several weeks ago, the last time I had preached, about how the man sold, once he found the treasure, he sold everything he had so that he could go and buy that field and then bury that treasure again and keep that field because he understood how valuable that treasure is. When we say that it's a way of life, we are saying, God, you are that treasure. I want to spend. I am willing to give up anything and everything in my life so that I can spend time with you. If that means, Father, that I am doing the wrong job, quit. I will quit my job because I want to pay attention to what it, where it is that you want me to go. What is it that you're going to have me doing? How do I get my life to understand that you, God, are everything? And that's what it means when he says it's a way of life. It involves not only agreeing with him and believing in him, it also involves committing to him, saying, Jesus, I'm so glad to receive your free gift. And that's what it is, a free gift of eternal life that I am willing to follow you and to be your disciple, your student, your man, or your woman for the rest of my life. I am willing to commit my life to you obeying you, following you, worshiping you, pleasing you, until that day comes in the future when you will usher me from this life into the next life to come. And that, friends, that is the answer to the question, what difference does it make? I'm going to have our worship team come back out here, and we're going to close with that, the same song that we opened with, uh, Death Was Arrested. It makes a difference from here to eternity if you act on it. It defeats death. It removes fear. It banishes tears. And it gives meaning to life. If you have any hope of defeating death, fear, and sorrow, you have to act on this information individually. Personally, at some point in time. And I pray for God's sake and for your sake that you would even do that now. And as our worship team is going to lead us in this song, I will be up here for anybody who not only just needs prayer, but I will be up here if you're someone that said, you know what? I do not have that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to have a relationship with that Christ. I want to know what this treasure is. I want to know what is this treasure that is so worth dying for. Just as we talked about last week when we pick up our cross, what does that mean? It's a call to die. If you don't have that relationship, come up here and I will pray with you and I will talk with you. If you're someone who says, you know what, I realize that I have not been living the way that I am supposed to have been living. I am living outside of how God wants me to live. I will be up here to pray with you. And if we have any of our other prayer team in here, they will be up here to pray with you. Jesus Christ is so worth living for. He is that treasure that is worth sacrificing everything else for to have. He is that worth it, and he is that good.